to wrap up what has been a two-month season with you that we've called Firm Foundations. And what I have prayed for and hoped for is that your faith would be stronger than ever. Uh, but what I also know to be true is that even in two months, we're barely scratching the surface of all the different doctrines and theologies of the Christian faith that we really need to know and have uh, rooted firmly in our hearts. And so I guess my biggest prayer for you is that you'll walk out of this season more curious than ever and more focused on God's word than ever. We're gonna wrap up today. We, we've talked about the most misunderstood or under attack, under attack doctrines in the Christian faith. We, we've talked about um, orthodoxy and the need we have to keep with it. Uh, we talked about gender, we talked about sexuality, uh, we talked about the Bible, we talked about uh, the doctrines of hell and salvation and sanctification. And today we're gonna talk about uh, God's team, not the Rangers, um, <laughs> though they're close, the church. And I wanna read to you from Ephesians 4. And this is actually, you might remember, this is where we started this journey two months ago. And today we're gonna end this journey right here in the same scripture. Here's what it says. It says, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, you might remember this, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up, turn your neighbor and say, you gotta grow up. We are to grow up, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> we are to grow up, some of y'all like that too much. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Uh, when, I love this little uh, caveat here, he says, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And everybody said, amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that today as we just look at what you've taught us in your scripture about the church, we would realize who we are, what we're called to do, who we're called to be, and how important that is in this world today with everything we see happening all around us. The stakes are higher than ever. Your message to us about your church is more important than ever. God, I pray against the, the evil and the lazy idea that church is just something I go to. And I pray for hearts and minds to awaken today to what your word says, that church is who we are and that we matter so much. I pray that the result would be that you would use us. We cry Jesus for San Antonio. Jesus for this state, this nation. Jesus for this world. That's the cry of our hearts, God. That's the cry of our hearts. Jesus for that next generation. Jesus for those children down there in Rev Kids right now. Jesus for the neighbors on our streets that don't know you. We love you, Jesus, and we cry out, use us. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You can grab a seat. And... Uh, have you, ever, um, have you ever been somewhere? This happens to me a lot in restaurants. And when you get there, you're, you're confused. Like, what kind of place is this? Has that ever happened to you? There's a kind of a running joke. It's not really a joke. It's totally true in our family that, that my wife should not pick the restaurants. She just doesn't have a good record, if you know what I mean. And we were in Dallas back in February, and I said, just, I'm trying to drive and navigate, you know, DFW, and I'm like, just find something on your phone, and we'll go. And she's like, there's a burger place that looks interesting, so we drive over there, we get to this place, and I'm not making this up, it's a burger, like, a burger place. Burger's like an American thing, right? It's a burger place that also has Lebanese food. <laughs> and the menu is like, it's like Cheesecake Factory, y'all ever been there? Yeah, I can't figure out what Cheesecake Factory is. I know they have cheesecake, 
But then the menu's like a mile long. I'm like, guys, pick something that you do and just do it, okay? And quit doing all these other things you don't do. And that's kind of how this place was. And we're up there and we're ordering. And, you know, my daughter, she's not the most prolific eater. She's like, oh, she's getting all nervous. And the guy's like, I can make pizza too. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> that wasn't even up on the menu. I like places like Pete Terry's. Y'all ever been there? They sell a burger and it's really good. And that's it. And if it, that's it. Like in and out you can get a burger. If it, I, I hate when I'm at in and out and there's someone in front of me and it's taking them forever to order. I'm like, burger? That's all they sell. <laughs> Restaurants like that are confusing. Um, and that's kind of what happens in church today. There's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ about what the body of Christ is, about its role in this world, um, about who we're, we're called to be and the people we're, we're called to reach. And people get real confused about church. I've been pastoring over 20 years now, and here's kind of some of the patterns I've seen. I thought of three, three reasons we get confused about church. The biggest reason is that people don't read their Bible. And we'll just come out the gate today, y'all, right? Like, <laughs> people don't read their Bible, and so since they don't read their Bible, they have these misplaced and unrealized expectations of church that come from a, just a, an earthly mindset. Or maybe just like a family tradition. You see that one a lot as well. I grew up in the Catholic church, so I, I very much understand this. In, in other words, what happens is, since they don't know what God's word says about church, they just cr make up their own idea, their own mind about what church is supposed to be, rather than going, let's go see what God says his church is supposed to be. And then as a result of that, people get let down by church, or they say, I have church hurt. But it, you trace it back, and it's like, well, yeah, of course you do, because you didn't even know what church is. Okay, now let's completely flip that script. Another reason is that church leaders, such as myself and church members, fail. Let's acknowledge that, that there are failures in the church, that the church is not perfect, right? And that when we fail, it brings confusion to people. And I just wanna say, church, like the stakes are high for us to get this right. This matters a lot that we understand who we are. And God's not looking for perfection. Praise God, he's not looking for perfection. But God is looking for a pulse. And he is looking for us to lean in his direction. Not in something we've created ourselves. And then the third thing I thought of is, you know, there's just this general dislike and disagreement that's kind of rising with the idea of church today. There's a, a general cynicism that is developing against God's church. And I just wanna point out that that kind of a fire is only stoked by the pit of hell. Jesus loves the church so much he died for her. Let's not forget that. And so when we see this kind of general cynicism rising against just churches, and where does that come from? God or hell? Definitely from the pit of hell. Now, there may be a time when a person feels led by God uh, to lead a specific church for a biblical reason. That's never happened at our church. No one's ever left. That's a joke, guys. <laughs> Total joke. There, there are times a person might feel led by God to leave a specific local church, okay, for a biblical reason. But I wanna point out that there is zero room in the Bible for a Christian to leave the church altogether. Just God's church in general. That would be straight disobedience to God. There is no biblical grounds to leave the church. And so if we can just kind of start with the heart behind this, you know, God has a clear goal for us all throughout scripture. God's goal is that we would love and honor the church, even with her faults. Even with her faults, because Jesus gave his life for her. Can I just tell you, I love the church. I love the church, that's my bias. I am operating from a bias today. I love the church. It's also supposed to be your bias if you love Jesus. If you love Jesus, your bias is I love the church. I'm gonna call today's message, the bride ain't ugly. Too many people saying the bride's ugly today. Like you wouldn't let your, your son at a wedding look over and go, <laughs> woo. That's an ugly bride. You'd be like, shh, 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 right? And that's kind of what I'm going to do today to the church. Just let's line our hearts with what God says. We're, we're going to do some ecclesiology. That's the study of the church. Today, I have found that Christians have very poor ecclesiology. 
And I've been trying to give you some books. Uh, probably the best book I've read on church in the last 10 years, if you want to go grab it, it's called Killer Church. It was written by a guy named Nathan Finocchio. It's also the most fun book that I've read in the last 10 years. This guy just has a great way of teaching theology in a very fun way where you actually want to read it. Whereas a lot of the books I've recommended, man, they are pretty brutal reads, still helpful, but brutal. So if you're like, I just wanna read something fun, or if, if you're a person that's like, I don't really read, okay, go start with this one. It might make you wanna read a little more, okay? And so some ecclesiology today. Let's just kind of define the church. The universal church is a heavenly and eschatological assembly of all believers, past, present, and future. The local church is an assembly of kingdom citizens, identified by regularly gathering together in Jesus' name and unified through faith in Christ. The church is committed to the teachings of Christ, to obeying all of his commands, somebody say all of them, and to teaching others who come to faith in Christ to do the same. The church's calling is to worship God forever and to serve God in the world by bringing the gospel to the world. Now, let me just kind of expound on that a little bit because there might be some terms in there that you know, didn't resonate with you because you've never really looked into ecclesiology. And first, I'll just tell you that the New Testament word translated into church is the word ecclesia. And it, in its most basic form, it just means assembly, okay? Not assembly like church service, but assembly, like us together, okay? All of us together. And the New Testament actually teaches us two kinds of ecclesia. The first is the ecclesia, the church, okay, in heaven. And then the second is the many churches on earth. These two kinds could be called the universal church, that'd be God's church, all Christians across all places, across all time, and the local church, aka the church you're sitting in today, or the church you grew up in, or if God moves you uh, somewhere else sometime in life, okay, the church that you will decide to be a part of, okay? To be a Christian, check this out, is to be a member of both. To be a Christian is to be a member of the universal church whereby God raises us up, as it says in scripture, in Christ and seats us in the heavenly places. That's what that means when you read that in scripture. Yet membership in that heavenly assembly, that universal church needs to also show up right here, right now on earth. And the way we do that is gathering together as a local church. Here's what I love so much about this, okay? The heavenly Universal church, okay, in other words, is expressed through earthly local churches, which in turn display and point to the heavenly church. A biblical posture will emphasize both of these. We need to understand and see ourselves as a part of both. And such a posture entails pursuing your individual discipleship within a local church church. So when we say, hey, we bring heaven to earth, now you're starting to kind of see and understand why that's so important and how that works. But the problem is that here in the Western world, the church is in a state of upheaval. People have all kinds of ideas about church that have nothing to do with what the Bible says. People post all kinds of ideas about church. We have, we literally have like a whole branch of, of social media influencers labeled as Christian influencers that aren't even getting this stuff right. Most of it's based on how they feel or a church experience they had. Very little of it is based in scripture. Then you have the church hopper, church shopper mentality. People constantly uh, jumping around between churches and kind of asking, what can the church do for me? Which is the complete wrong question. People, people say things like, well, is the church close to where I live? I can't be bothered to drive far, right? Is it luxurious? I only associate with luxury brands. Or is it meat in a warehouse? Right? Do, do I get what I want, when I want it, and how I want it? Because it's about me. This mentality of consumerism, it is killing the church. It's killing the church. And if I can just like have some grace for a second and try to see this through the lens of grace, like I guess we kind of come by it honestly because we live in a world 100% about consuming. 
We even have entire apps, right, uh, designed to destroy businesses. No one leaves good reviews. They only leave bad reviews, right? They only talk bad about the restaurant, right? And, and, and then we kind of drag that stuff, which is worldly stuff, into the church. Remember, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We have to be careful here. I, I would say we need to completely reevaluate our posture as it pertains to God's church. We don't exist as a church to get. We exist to give. Never forget in every area of life that, that as Christians, we kind of live in this constant tension between real life, like where we are right here, right now, okay? The real and the ideal, where God wants to take us and where he's calling us to. And the tension is that we know we won't ever fully reach the ideal on this side of eternity. However, we, we have to remember that the existence and the vision of the ideal should always continually pull us up out of the real towards the ideal. Do you see how that works? This is what it looks like to become more and more like Jesus. So as God's church, turn to your neighbor and say, you're the church. How do we live that out? How do we live out God's ideal? Reach for God's ideal. Move towards God's ideal right here, right now. What is our purpose? What do we do? Let's start by talking about the purposes of the church. The church has three purposes. Purpose number one is ministry to God. That's called worship. First and foremost, the church exists to worship God. Everything else flows from that. Now, right off the bat, you can see how backwards we have this because the Western church thinks the primary thing of church somehow centers on us, on me. So we have it 100% wrong. This whole thing's not about worshiping the way we want to worship. This whole thing's about worshiping God the way God wants to be worshiped. How does God want to be worshiped? Well, Colossians 3, Paul directs the church at Colossae to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. Worship is music and singing. We just did that today. But worship is also way more than just music and singing. Can I get an amen? amen. This isn't a sermon on worship, but I'll just remind you, Ephesians 1, Paul also says that we are to live to the praise of his glory. So think about worship as a daily commitment, every day, all day, to God's word, okay, and to God to what God tells us to do, to, to God, to his word, to his ways. You can think of it this way. Uh, worship means we read the Bible, we preach the Bible, we pray the Bible, we sing the Bible, we live the Bible, all of it cover to cover, exactly how it says. That's worship. That's the first purpose of the church, to worship God. The second purpose of the church is ministry to believers. We call this discipleship. So ministry to God, worship. Second, ministry within the body. Ministry to other believers, that's discipleship. Colossians 1 and Ephesians 4 both teach us that as the church, we disciple each other. We build each other up to maturity in the faith and that the whole goal is to equip the saints, scripture says, and to present everyone as mature in Christ. So, so our goal as a church is that before your funeral, we could say, God, they ain't perfect, but they're mature in Christ. That is the goal. Discipleship is the biblical prescription for healthy churches. Now, let's kind of flip this one around because today the church, again, has a lot of pe people that are they're, they're kind of there to be entertained or, or maybe like, okay, I did my hour, check church off the to-do list for the week instead of having a discipleship mindset. A discipleship mindset is I'm here to be equipped. I'm here to be trained. I'm here to learn the word. I'm here to also help others do the same. I'm here to grow. I'm here to be sent out to share the gospel across the world. A disciple sees church as a thing, a person, a calling that they have, that they are every day, all day, 24 seven, not as a building that they go to for an hour, maybe two hours, a week, there's a huge difference. And I believe in Revolution Church, by the way, y'all. I believe in it. We have amazing leaders here at this church, not perfect leaders, but amazing leaders, amazing classes, mechanisms, groups to help you be equipped, to help you mature, to help you be sent out. I've always thought of it this way. Our whole job here is to serve you a big, beautiful, biblical meal. 
We are here to serve Jesus Christ. He said he's the bread of life. We're here to serve the bread. And then the Bible self-defines as spiritual meat, that spiritual sinew, that spiritual protein shake. But here's the deal. We can't make you eat the meat and the bread. We can't force feed you Jesus, the bread of life, and the Bible, the spiritual meat. That never goes well. We can't do it. We can present it in a clear and compelling way. We can create the meal. We can serve the meal, but we can't make you eat. That's your decision. And a disciple is somebody who's made the decision to eat the meal, to follow God, even when their preferences don't align with what God's word says. You see this actually happen in Matthew chapter eight. Um, Jesus meets two different Jewish guys. And the first guy is a scribe. And he basically says, Jesus, I choose you and I will follow you wherever you go. Now, something you might not know is that in their culture, uh, a Jew would choose from the menu of rabbis which rabbi they were going to follow, but they would follow the rabbi on their own terms. So Jesus is like, that's not how we're gonna do it in the kingdom. And he turns that whole thing on its head and he says back to the guy, the son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head at night. And this guy that's like, I'm all team Jesus. I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus is silent because he wants all the blessings of being a follower of Jesus, but he doesn't want to pay the price of being a follower of Jesus. And then the second guy approaches and same thing. I want to follow you, Jesus. I choose you as my rabbi, Jesus. Uh, but Jesus, I do need a leave of absence to go bury my father. And Jesus actually says, no, you don't get to do that. Now, you need to know Jesus isn't mean telling him he can't go bury his father. Bury my father is a Jewish phrase that meant, I'm gonna go live with my father the rest of his life. So, so what he's basically saying here is he's saying, Jesus, I wanna follow you just later, not now. And Jesus says, discipleship's gotta take precedent. It's a right now thing, not a later thing. Discipleship's how we draw closer to God, it's how we draw closer to the body of Christ. It's how we get stronger in our faith. And it always comes with a great cost, every single time. So does discipleship take precedent for you? Discipleship is your decision. The third purpose of the church is ministry to the world. And this is what we call evangelism. In fact, after Jesus resurrects, um, he tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, 19, this is known as the Great Commission. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and I am with you even to the end of the age. He's saying we have to go into all of the world and share the gospel. The church is God's indispensable instrument through which the unsaved world meets Jesus. The church is the only hope for the unsaved world to meet Jesus. And it is through the ministry of the church that people meet Jesus and, and they're given the keys to the kingdom. This evangelistic work we all have of declaring the gospel is the primary ministry the church has to the world. Okay, when I am not saying, to be clear, I'm not saying evangelism is more important than worship or discipleship. It's absolutely not. I am saying, though, that evangelism, as you study the scriptures, is our primary ministry to the unbelieving world. They don't need worship or discipleship. They're not believers yet. And this is where we have to be careful instead of having this heart where it's like we see the world acting a fool. They're the world. They're going to act a fool. We have to apply the heart of evangelism to reach them with the gospel of Christ when we see them acting a fool. Can I get an amen? We have, to, we have to stay focused on the undeniable fact that we're called by God to build his kingdom one life at a time and that when, when we do it right, by the way, the church grows. Last time I checked, healthy things always grow. Let's just talk about that a second. Can we stop arguing about big church and small church? We have got to move past this. Both are in the Bible. There's big churches and small churches in the Bible. I bet you didn't know that. Small churches are not good or bad. Big churches are not good or bad. Bad churches are bad. And good churches are good. Can we agree on that? And size will change things like structure and experience and facilities, okay? But good, bad is not a function of size. 
I'm just trying to get you to see some of the illogical fallacies that we have taken and applied to church. And what's so funny is like I walk all over the room and get all different kinds of answers. And everybody will think they're right. Everybody will think they're like, I'm right because it's small church. No, I'm right because it's big church. But I've found that most people in, Re- in our church, Revolution Church, they don't even know what size church they attend because we're spread across four services. Y'all got no idea. <laughs> Unless you're like me and you're here all four and you can do some math, you just, you literally have no idea that you come to a church that's about 1,500 people every weekend. God's doing something special here that has nothing to do with the size. It has to do with the people, the spiritual growth, the baptisms, the life change, the fact that people's lives are being changed. It has to do with the fact that people here are wanting, wanting to live, desiring to live from a place where they understand the the true and the righteous fear of God that we've got to have. Like when we understand that, and when we help this true and righteous fear of God fall upon people who don't know the Lord, that becomes a doorway to revival. That's what we're seeing happen here. We we can't drink too heavily from the, the well of rationalism when we serve a supernatural God that has empowered us to do supernatural stuff. For the Christian, Supernatural stuff, it sounds kind of weird, should be normal. It's just like every day. Yep, yep, God did that. Yep, yep, couldn't see. Driving to church in the fog this morning, God parted the fog, got here safe. It was awesome. <laughs> Rangers had no hope just about two months ago, had lost so many games. God, God said, no, I'm just gonna put my hand on Garcia and Seeger and that stuff should be totally normal for us. But, but too many Christians ignore it. And this is why evangelism doesn't happen. It's because we're scared. We're scared by the world we live in when we're supposed to rule the world that we live in and share the gospel. Romans 1 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel's advanced when we exercise the power of God that's inside of us. It's called the Holy Spirit. So three purposes, we worship, We make disciples and we evangelize. All three, clearly commanded by our king in scripture, we seek to balance all three. A strong church will be effective at all three. And the stakes are so high that we get this right. Because again, the church, God's new covenant people are his only chosen instrument to expand his kingdom. Think about that for a second, okay? What is the church? Okay, in the old covenant, uh, the whole old covenant was built on a holy building called the temple and on some holy artifacts like the, the Ark of the Covenant. But in the new covenant, the new covenant's built on a holy people, a called out, set apart, chosen people called the church. So the church is God's people. It's not buildings, it's not services, it's not programs. Um, buildings, services, programs, all that stuff, super important tools that we use but it's not the church, not technically. So if church is not the building, the program, the tools, if that's not church, what is church? What is church? It's people, but it's, it's more specific than that. And the Bible provides about five metaphors. I'm gonna give you the three biggest metaphors to help us understand the kind of people that we're called to be. First, I'll take you to Ephesians 2. It says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and look at this last part, and members of the household of God. The household of God. Romans 8, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Tell your neighbor, you're a child of God. And if children, then heirs. And if heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So here's the first metaphor. The church is the family of Christ, the family of God. This is very much a family. And this speaks to our identity, our security, and also our adoption. 
And if you've never studied the doctrine of adoption, I encourage you to go check it out. It's one of the most wonderful doctrines we have in the Christian faith. And, and I have found that people that seem to kind of be most content in the church and kind of understand church the best and kind of do and live the idea of church the best are just, it just so happens there are people that understand that, that if they love Jesus, they're a son, they're a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Not just like a member, no, literally a child of God. Because if you understand you're literally a child of God, you start to kind of live and flow in the promises of God. Your identity starts to get really clear. Your security starts to get really, really firm when you realize you're adopted into the family of God. And every week when we say, I am, uh, oh my gosh, blanking out. <laughs> I got ranger brain, deeply loved, highly favored, greatly blessed, totally righteous. What's the last one? Destined to reign. That's what that means. We're, we're talking about, y'all are like, you wrote that and you got it wrong. <laughs> I told y'all there's no such thing as a perfect church. Okay. D that's what it means when we say I'm destined to reign. We're talking about the fact that we are adopted into the family of God. And that's why this, this doctrine is so, so very important. Um, but since we're talking about family, let's also talk about this. That also means we got to be careful. Because what we'll do is we'll unintentionally pull things from our worldly family into the family of God. And our worldly families are not perfect. And they're not led by perfect people, okay? But our spiritual family, the church, is led by somebody absolutely perfect in every way. His name is Jesus. He is always perfect. Now, the house is not always perfect. The kids do a lot of dumb stuff. Can we just agree on that? Amen. Right? Just like in your house, your, your, your kids bicker, right? And relationships get funky, and we say dumb things and do dumb things, and and we're hurtful sometimes, but at the end of the day, we're still a family. Okay, Jesus is the head of his house. His house has love, all the things you want in your family. It has mutual respect. It's got unity. It's got order. Oh, it also has chores. Any parents like, my house has chores? No? You don't know to make your kids do chores in this church? I got to do a parenting series after this. <laughs> There's chores in the house. There's expectations in the house. Like the, the family members need to pull their weight. It's always frustrating to go to like family Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's running around to make uh, the games and the, the meal and the football, cheering, whatever your family does for Thanksgiving. Like you're all cheering, you're all having fun, you're all celebrating Thanksgiving, but then there's Uncle Frank and he's just sitting his lazy butt on the couch doing nothing. You're like, what's up with that guy? And it's kind of like that in church. There's chores in this family. You're like, what do you mean? We serve. We give, we share, uh, we make the mission happen together. We make a difference, right? We, we change our world together. There's chores, there's chores. And the way God's designed the family, it's just like your family. No, nobody gets to be lazy and sit on the couch in the family of God. And, and we say that not because we want something from you. We say it because we want something for you. Just like parents, you, you probably don't make your kids do chores because you actually need them to do the chores. Sometimes you're way better at the chores and you're like, I'm just gonna do this because this sucks. <laughs> like they always forget the trash bag. They can't do this right. They always spill that. They never do this. They never, it'd just be a lot better to do it yourself. But why do you have your kids do the chores? Because it teaches them something. Something valuable that you know they need in their life. So it's about something you want for them. And the same thing is true in the house of God, okay? But we, we, we push you towards these things. It's called discipleship. Remember, that was our second purpose. We push you towards these things because we're family. Metaphor two, the scriptures teach us that the church is the body of Christ. The body. Everybody say body. So we're a family. We're a body. The body speaks to our unity, our function, and our stability. Okay, the body of Christ is not just a crowd of people gathered haphazardly for no reason. There's structure. There's intentionality. There's stability. There's function. There's unity. And the picture the New Testament gives us for this is the body. And I'll just point out that the church is never in, in the Bible called a body. It's only ever called the body of Christ or a body in Christ. And that's different. Because what that means is that our significance as a body only comes from Christ. 
And that's why the church is different than any other organization or institution on this planet. It's because we are brought together by God. Every other organization or institution is brought together on a human basis. This is what sets the church apart. 1 Corinthians 12 says, just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, then he says, so it is with Christ. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Now you, now he's talking to the church, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Now, the thing that makes this statement so interesting from Paul, his topic's unity, but he makes this statement, so it is with Christ. What is he saying? He is saying that the church is literally a part of Christ himself. And this is just one of those things that when, like, we just don't spend enough time in God's word. We glaze over scriptures way too fast like this. How incredible is it that that God says we are literally a part of Christ's body? Do not miss that. Ephesians 4 says the whole body joined and held together by every joint, we read this earlier, with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. Okay, if we're a body, like don't you want every part of your body to work properly? Isn't that kind of the goal? Doesn't it kind of stink when some part's not working right? Okay, it's the same in the body of Christ. When we get everything working right, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So when you see a church get stuck, you see a church that's not growing, what does that mean? It means there's a part of the body not doing its job. It means there's some parts of the body not doing what they're supposed to do. So church, the body of Christ, is pictured not as an organization, it's very much more like an organism. It's living. It's rooted in the living word of God and in the relationship of each member individually with Christ, but also as a whole. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard for us to see sometimes because of how much we focus on individuality in America. That's not a bad thing. It's great when applied in that context, but when we drag that into the church and go too far with it, it actually starts to hurt us. Church is built on the spiritual strength and connection every member has with King Jesus and with each other, just like a body. Now, it also speaks, the fact that we're a body, to unity. Okay, we have a common relationship with Christ. You think about the piano back there, okay? A piano's not tuned um, with each note in relationship to the other notes. A piano's tuned with each note in relationship to the tuning fork. And every single one of those individual notes on the piano, every one of those keys has got to be tuned correctly to the fork for it to sound right. The body of Christ is just like that. Our unity is based on our common relationship with Christ, the fact that he has made us all members of his body, and therefore, Scripture says, members of one another. And this is why the church can bring together people who would never hang out together in any other place in the world. Have you ever noticed that? Look around the room. These ain't your people. Look around the room. There's probably a few you'd hang out with, but the church is different. The church does something different and supernatural and unique. Uh, People of every race, every age, every economic status, every educational background, every personality type, and so many more factors. Think how little we have in common with each other. Like from a worldly perspective, you actually, I'm gonna let y'all in on a secret. You ready for this? Some of you aren't gonna like it. There's some Democrats here. Cat's out of the bag, guys. We have people in our church who voted every way. And by the way, probably more who didn't vote at all, and that's got to change. I'll just throw that in. Okay, so I love the diversity of the church is what I'm trying to say. And that's not my design. That's God's design. And I love that one of the biggest compliments our church gets behind the scenes, you don't see this, but anytime we have a guest speaker, they always say the same thing. They say, you have one of the most diverse churches I have ever been in. What a cool thing. What a cool compliment for us to get. So if we're a body, what does the body look like when it's functioning right? Okay, well, we actually have a passage in Scripture. It's in the book of Acts, chapter 2. It's a picture of the first church. I do want to point out before I read this, though, that God never says the goal is that we mimic exactly the first church. Okay, culture changes, and so the way that we reach out has to change. 
the, the message never changes, but the strategy and the systems and what works has to change or else we become antiquated. But here's what it says. It says, those who received his word were baptized. There's some great markers in here. There should be baptisms. And there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. I hate big churches. Well, you hate the very first church because it grew by 3,000 people day one. They devoted themselves. Oh, so they were devoted to some things. What things were they devoted to? To the apostles' teaching, which by the way is just the teaching of the word of God, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So I read that because I used to think that the body of Christ was asking too much of members. I used to think like, we gotta be gentle with the members and careful with the members and you know, manage their time for them because they're not good at it. And I used to kind of think that way. But as I study all the scriptures say about church, I actually realize the opposite is what's true. We ask way too little of the members. The body does not expect enough from the body today. The, the body's built to do some things. The body's built for a purpose, not to sit on the sidelines. If you sit on the sidelines, your body starts to atrophy, right? We've got people to love, a gospel to present, people to serve, a world to change, truth to share, prayers to pray, generosity to give. We have a financial cost to share in. We have a, a building to build. We have the light of Jesus we're called to shine. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to keep it kingdom. The Bible is our truth. Jesus changes lives. These things are our realities. We have a mission that matters in a world that needs the Lord. We must be the body. And then here's the last metaphor. The church is the bride of Christ. Everybody say the bride. This is all about Jesus' love and sacrifice for us. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a scripture really fast. You're gonna think it's about husbands and wives. It's not. You can learn a lot about being a husband or a wife from these verses, but don't get too caught up in the husband and wife parts, okay? Focus on the church parts. Here we go. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Don't get too caught up, ladies. All the guys are like, I love this church. Don't. <laughs> For the husband is the head of the wife, okay? Even, okay, he's given a picture, as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The mystery is profound. And then he's like, just in case you didn't get it, I'm saying that this refers to Christ and the church. So this whole thing of like hating on the church, it's gotta stop. Because what you're essentially saying is, I love Jesus, but his bride, ew. She's so horrible, she's so gross. Which bride, you mean the bride he died for? Which bride, you mean you? Me? I, I would imagine it grieves the heart of Jesus the way some people talk about his bride, the way some people treat his bride. So if you say you love Jesus, you must come to grips with this. And I encourage you to do so by just reading what the Bible says, because the Bible is our truth. And every one of us approaches church with all these preconceived ideas. A lot of them, again, they're just stuff we grew up, we heard it, we assumed it was in the Bible and true. And then we look and we go, wow, none of that's in there. I don't know if you remember this story, but just before Jesus goes to the cross, Peter denies him three times. Do you remember that? Well, later after Jesus resurrects, he meets Peter on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. You can go to the exact spot today. I've, I've been there a couple times. Um, and, and Jesus tells Peter three times. He says, do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Tend to my flock. Feed my sheep. He does it three times. Peter is like lost in the moment. So great like grieved that, that Jesus says it three times, failing to recognize Jesus says it three times because Peter denied Jesus three times. He's literally restoring 
all three of Peter's sins of denying Jesus. And in the process of doing so, he's kind of connecting some dots for Peter that end up setting the course and the direction for the rest of Peter's life. And that's this. He's teaching Peter, hey, Peter, to love me is to love my church because she's my bride. And so Peter's very restoration is connected to his willingness to love God's people and his commitment to God's people, the church. And then, of course, Peter's instrumental in starting the very first church. And so I would just encourage you, loving God his way, we won't get to decide how we love God. We love God the way God has said we love God. Seeing the church God's way and then experiencing like a fully embodied participation in the life of the church God's way. That's how we demonstrate to the Lord that we're in a relationship with him on his terms, not our own terms, ever so conscious of his preferences, not our own preferences. There's, there's one great reminder that I think our churches need today. I just want to close by sharing it with you. And it's found in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, you are living stones, living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, here's a key phrase, you are his holy priests. You are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. So the great reminder I believe the church needs today is that if you're a Christian, you're a priest. Most Christians I meet today don't, don't understand this. The Bible literally says if you're a Christian, you're a priest. You have a job to do. The priesthood is literally your job. That's what the Bible says. This is how the new covenant works. In the new covenant, you and I are the priests. We minister to the Lord and to others in that order, by the way. Jesus first. And so when we walk into church, if we're priests, hey, I'm not here for me. I'm reporting for duty, Jesus. I'm here for God and his people. And this is the responsibility of every single believer in Jesus, that we would function as priests in the new covenant, that we would worship God, that we would make sure we're being discipled and involved in discipling others, and that we would share the gospel to the ends of the earth. What we have instead today is a lot of churches full of detached Gnostic consumers. And it's not working, and it's not what God says. I believe we have to begin to pick up the weight associated with being the priests we're called to be and carry that weight. I believe we're not alone in our salvation, that God has designed us each as these living stones, these building blocks to build his household, the local church. Jesus loves his bride. He died for his bride, whether you love her or not. And you have a decision to get on board with that or to do your own thing. Would you pray with me? My prayer has been that you would walk out today with all the motivation you need. And that's that Jesus loves his bride, the church. It's undeniable. We shouldn't need anything else to say, I wanna be a part of that bride, an effective part of that bride. I wanna be who he's called me to be. I wanna be found faithful, presented to himself in splendor, like it said in Ephesians chapter five, without spot or wrinkle, holy without blemish. That's my prayer. That's my prayer for us as a church. And if you're not a Jesus follower, let me just kind of go back to the the sons and daughters thing. The doctrine of adoption. God stands ready to forgive you. He, he finished the work totally and completely. Through his son, Jesus, he, he covered every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit. Jesus took the punishment and the death that you deserve. And the Bible says, if you will simply, in a moment of faith, repent from your sins and receive by faith God's forgiveness and new life, that you'll be forever changed. You become a part of the family, adopted, a son, a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, part of this beautiful household, not perfect, but beautiful, called the local church. If that's you, salvation is a free gift you can receive today. And we like to help people kind of take that step in just a, 
an easy to remember and mark way by, by praying a prayer. If the prayer doesn't do anything, this prayer's not like pulled out of the Bible. It's just being in this place and knowing that you're saying yes to Jesus today. So if that's you, would you pray like this and let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, yes. Would you make me your son, your daughter? Would you change my life? Thank you that I'm adopted into your family. I receive it. I believe it. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, his resurrection. I repent from my sin and I trust you, God. Make me new. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.